Good morning. This is the Focus on Parliament show on Civic Space TV, brought to you by the Center for Constitutional Governance. I am Isaac Kwagala, your host. With the passage of a, an unprecedented 72 trillion budget, a new financial year beckons for the country, triggering a new wave of optimism for the Ugandan citizen. This despite an entrenched culture of political corruption, impunity, and of course, issues to do with fiscal indiscipline by the government. On this edition of the Focus on Parliament show, we discuss and contextualize the budget speech as read out by the finance minister at the Kololo Independence Grounds. Our viewers, once again, you are most welcome to the program. I now have the pleasure and the privilege to introduce to you our distinguished panelists to help us understand the topic for discussion. From my extreme right is the gentleman, the executive director for the Center for Policy Analysis and the Parliament Watch, Mr. Timothy Chemonges. You are most welcome to the program, Timothy. Say hello to the viewers. Thank you, Isaac, and uh, good morning to our viewers. I'm glad to be here. Once again, I think that um, the topic that we are looking is very pertinent for the growth of this country, but also more importantly, how we operate, how we uh, move as a country in light of, uh, in light of uh, the governance structure, but also service delivery. And so this topic is specifically dear to me, uh, not just because of, of the figures, but also because of what it means to the country mm. and, and, and really what um, the future or the coming days look like for, for us. It's a Thank pleasure you. to have you, Timothy. Thank you. Thank Next you. to Timothy is the gentleman, Mr. Frank Buambale. He's a journalist, a researcher, and a human rights defender. Frank, you're most welcome to the program. Say hello to the viewers. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Isaac, for hosting me. Uh, good morning to you, our esteemed viewers. I'm happy to feature on this panel so that we throw more light on the budgeting process and we, al we also assess the impact of the budget on the citizenry. Uh, the people's input vis-a-vis -vis their expectations from the government. I thank you. You're most welcome, Frank. Thank you. And last but not least is the gentleman right next to me, Mr. Osomo Wanda, who is the Managing Director for Chesa Africa Limited. Mr. Wanda, you must welcome to the program. Say hello to the viewers. Yes, good morning, viewers. I'm glad to be here today as we look at our budgeting process, appreciating our position as a country and how government intervenes in transforming our lives and taking us forward. The budget process is vital to that process. So I'm glad to be here and contributing my ideas to the whole process. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Timothy, let me start with you <coughs> so that you can give the viewers out there a background of what exactly the budgetary process is. But also, let me highlight uh, from the speech of the finance minister some of the priorities that he cited as the major growth areas for the economy, among which is education, health, water, hygiene, security, and of course the a broad question of the infrastructure development of the country. So even as you lay out that uh, background for the benefit of the viewer, what has been your major takeaway from the budget speech yesterday? So thank you so much. So um, the budget speech yesterday, again, for me, what stood out was the, was, it was the continuous uh, emphasis by the head of state on the question of corruption. While indeed it appears and sounds extremely good that as a country we are determined towards the fight of corruption and that there is action that's going to be taken, I think for me that's where focus was on. Because at the end of the day, you can have an excellent budget. As we've had in the past, in terms of figures, in terms of ideas, in terms of how it should be implemented. But the level of impunity in this country frustrates the budget process, implementation and execution. And that goes to the extent of ensuring that there is value for money. Two, there is accountability in the use of the same money. Three, 
is on the transparency of the use of the same money. And I'm glad that um, we, are, we, are, we are in a time when there seems to be action um, being taken on the corruption uh, issues. We've seen a few of, uh, of the individuals, uh, some members of parliament, being uh, presented before court on, 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 on matters regarding corruption and their involvement in the same. Uh, we can only hope that uh, there can be more uh, push on that direction. Otherwise, budget process, which is purely premised on corruption mm. or entertainment of the same, is, 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 a, is a futile process. And so for me, again, that's, 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 that's the major thing. Looking at the budget, emphasizing that the question of corruption must be clearly dealt with, to the impunity within the government bureaucracies, but also individuals that serve in there, and lastly, the question of transparency and accountability. Of course, there's a broader conversation beyond this, <coughs> where we are looking at the question of democracy and the rule of law, where the country is premised. And if you're not following that, then the rest of the things definitely will follow the direction that the two are taking. Mm. So that, that's, that's my brief. Um, uh, just as a follow-up question, Timothy, before I bring in uh, Frank, does it concern you that um, we have quite an unprecedented budget in terms of uh, the monies mm. uh, that have been, you know, um, allocated to the various sectors of the economy? And initially, I think the projection was that it was going to be up to a tune of 50 trillion, something and then there was a jump significant jump by around 12 trillion yeah. does it concern you yes it, it, it does concern me um, partly on two friends the first is on the practicability of the of realizing this budget two the the the, the precedent that it sets mm. um, but again I, I, I aware that the budgeting process is not only an economic venture, it is also a, politi a political process. Mm. And those that are charged or the politicians, there are a couple of things that they would want to ensure that it, it, it fits into their political direction, but also their agreement with the electorate. So that is the direction. Um, but a few of questions, a number of questions really come up in light of whether we can be able to realize even that budget in the first place. Because if you see, it, 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 look, looking at uh, the current financial year, which, 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 we are, which we are looking at, which, which we are just ending now, you will notice that um, the budget as is usually comprised of two major areas, the revenue side, but also expenditure. Mm -hmm. How much are we, are we bringing on board and how are we spending this mm -hmm. amount of money? Um, in terms of revenue, I think there are a number of queries uh, that are there. Just maybe to highlight before we go into the, the discussion deeper, is that um, in, this, in this financial year 2023-2024, part of our resource projection in terms of how we're going to finance the 52.7 trillion budget that we are currently um, working on was that we would raise close to 29. Uh, 29.9 trillion 99, uh, from the from revenue collection yes, uh, and uh, listening to the president yesterday there seemed to be um, that the projection slightly fell short uh, of around 1.9 trillion which uh, is an approximately 2 trillion uh, um, in terms of uh, in terms of the external borrowing again uh -huh. looking at uh, we, we, we didn't realize what we had projected, partly because of the cost of the of, of borrowing mm. of some of these these debts out of the country, and so there, there's a big challenge. Now, this year we've 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 taken it a notch higher, and um, we are hoping that uh, we'll raise locally close to 32 trillion from local revenue. Mind you, we failed to raise the 29, and actually, by the way. Because we are not yet done with the, with, with the last quarter of this financial year. Uh, uh. As of the third quarter, we had raised approximately 20 trillion. And it's very unlikely from my projection that we are, we are even likely to go to what the president is saying of around 20, 20 27 point something trillion. And so we, my, my projection is that 
even this quarter may not lead us there. And so the point is that our, our economy as it is today, if you juxtapose it with the budget and the projections that we are having in this current budget, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's an effort in futility. And mm. we may not be able to realize that, partly because of the political processes. There's definitely reason as to why, and, and I, I'm, I'm inclined to, to agree with, uh, with the narrative that um, the executive, part of the reason as to why the executive chose to extend, to increase the, 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 the budget from the initial 52, point, 50, 52 trillion to now 72, mm. was to increase the three, was to increase the amount of money of the 3% mm -hmm. that government is allowed to spend without, necessarily, without the, the, the direct approval, approval of parliament, parliament. Mm. and they can account or they can come to seek for the approval mm. thereafter. That is a theory that closely comes to, to mind. But be, because in all, in, in, in all means and purposes, mm. Raising that amount of money mm. is not easy, especially now that our economy is, is, is at the space where it's, it's recovering and some of the measures we are trying to ensure that they work, um, ensure that we increase the tax base. And so we are not yet at, I think we are not yet at a place where we can comfortably say that um, the, the 72 trillion is what we should have. And by the way, let me just emphasize something. Looking at the total amount of money that we've ever raised mm. collectively from the previous times, from the previous years, mm. combining both the, the, the local revenue, the rollovers, the, the external borrowing, both domestic and external, mm. the most that we've actually collected has been around 48 trillion. The most. It means that the idea of pushing it to 72 trillion uh. is, 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 is not a practical one. But again, I think um, appreciating that this is also a political process uh. that can be abused by those in charge or can uh. be used for the well of the country, that's also something that must be taken. In, you know. But I think it's a, it's, it's a hard process. My biggest worry is where the executive is setting a precedent Actually, today I was just surprised that, that um, we have a slightly higher budget than Tanzania, which is fairly a bigger economy really? than Uganda. <laughs> the total budget of, uh, of Tanzania uh, is close to 70, 70, 70, 70 trillion. For the new financial year? Yes, that's UGX, Uganda shillings. And Uganda, which is slightly a smaller economy to Tanzania, has a budget of 72 trillion. Mm. So it brings a number of questions. Thank you, Timothy, for mm. that context mm. and perspective. Mr. Wanda, let me come to you. Uh, many analysts, as Timothy here correctly points out, uh, are of the view that this is quite an ambitious budget by any practical standard. But I want to ask the question, when you look at the major uh, focus areas of this budget that the finance minister yesterday cited out, uh, education, of course, health, water, security, and road infrastructure. As a citizen, what is the major takeaway for you from this budget? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, having an ambitious budget could be something positive we could look at. Because ultimately, in especially our developing economies, the role of government in driving the direction of the of the country yeah. and the economy for that matter is fundamental and is vital. Somehow the previous years, especially in this particular administration from the time they came into power, we've failed or we have struggled a great deal to put together resources that can allow us impact our economy and direction of the economy in a significant way. That in most cases, government has been formed to play a peripheral role with structure adjustment and the privatization that followed, government was basically removed from direct participation in the economy. Yeah. It started playing a back role to the direction of the country as far as the economy is concerned. And our budgets were rather small as a result. But that was because we, did not, we could not generate the resources 
to drive the budget process. The fact that our budget today is, is climbing to be almost 30% of our GDP is interesting. It's, it could be a look at that ambition, because if you look at Egypt, I think the budget process government is almost 50%. But this is because they can generate the resources locally. Uh, we do not yet. We are not yet able to do that. Uh, As you notice, our tax base or tax to GDP ratio is still quite low. So the ambition in this case is driven by the hope that we are getting resources from outside the country. Uh, now that's interesting. At what cost? Exactly. The fact that the process of pushing for this level of ambition or dream for that matter and yet the basis of the ambition is foreign based while at the same time we seem to be having a little bit of grapples with our foreign facilitators donors and the rest of them is the kind of disharmony you find with this particular budget but when you look at all this, you, you get to realize that the basis of this drive has come from the National Planning Authority. Uh -huh. So the development plan, the National Development Plan, tries to be ambitious uh -huh. that we do have to push ourselves into a more developed state. And the figures that we are quoting and we are trying to be, to be ambitious to land in the middle of mid-income economy within, say, 15 years. Uh -huh. For that to happen, there are particular four drivers, because these others that we talk of that are often part of the budget process are, norm, are the norm that uh -huh. you utilize to sustain a country and an economy. We, we've kind of gotten to a level where we've secured our security uh -huh. as a country. We really don't have any niggles and what you, we used to have rebel groups or whatever within the bound boundaries and we, of the country, uh -huh. we push them outside the country, and we've been able, for the first time, I think in our, in our history, or in the last 40 years, to start reaching out further to beyond borders, not even within, we don't allow them even to play around South Sudan, we push them even further, the Central Africa, we push them even further. That's a little bit of a success for us as a country, to be able to have a state that has that ability to push outside and not have any particular divisions of that level armed within the borders and within the neighbors, we've somehow been able to succeed at that level. So to push for this am ambition is interesting and it's a good idea. But the drivers that push this are having a knowledge economy. I think that's one of the core fundamental drivers they are trying to push. And with that, we talk of STEM sciences and, and the rest of them. Technology technology. and what? Exactly. Mm. We talk of tourism, mm. to push within tourism as another driver of this particular jump into middle income economy. We also talk of agro-based industrialization mm. as another. And the fourth seems to be mineral-based industrialization. Of those four, mm. it would seem the the ones that we have a little bit of an ability uh -huh. to push is agro-based industrialization, if we focused, and a little bit of tourism-based drivers. Those ones we have a local ability to push and do something about that and, and push our economy beyond. The ones that I find a little bit tricky uh -huh. are the knowledge-based part, because that will have to be foreign pushed. We don't, right now, countries that are pushing for knowledge-based development are talking of AI, they are talking of robotics, uh, they are talking of, of measles and other things that are slightly beyond what we have been able to achieve or study or what, we don't have those particular research-based institutions that are doing these particular areas. So if we think of investing in such areas, I don't know where we can get first of the resources and then the knowledge and the rest of it. This, that would be a little bit tricky. 
As for mineral-based industrialization, I think the one that the whole government is, that is driving the government's blood in this mm -hmm. is uh, oil. I think it's believed in the next year, two or three, the next period, mm -hmm. next five years, we are going to be big in oil production. So that seems to be an anchor that they feel a little bit more confident about driving the future development of the economy. And this may kind of explain why we get this jump mm. from 52 to 72 with the hope that resources from this particular area could be Can help to plug? Yes. Mm. Because in some areas it's been indicated that it will be up to $5 billion of investments per annum in the next five years, in the next four or five years. If that's the case, that would be interesting. But we've had this oil dream for the last <laughs> 20 years, 30 years, from even before, uh, we, we, through colonization, we they were aware of the oil, and the process of pushing for it has been on. Mm. It would seem within the corridors of power, finally we may, be, we may see the Eldorado oil, or black gold. But as that is the case, we know very well the cautionary tales around oil production for economies of our nature. If you have an economy going into that area and we have this flood of dollars in coming into the economy, the oil cast often follows. And it follows if you don't have systems, efficient systems in place that can help protect the rest of the economy from this glut of oil dollars. To me, that is the threat, number one threat we face going forward. Because when you see even within the IMF figures and projections, the deficit we see in our economy, the growth of the debt, and the rest of it, all seem to then narrow down two, three years up front. It would seem that it's believed in the two, three, four years period, what we've been worried about as the growth of the debt may reverse direction. But this is all based on the hope of mm. oil production. So to me, that, that has been the takeaway from what has been going on with the budget. And so knowing that those four drivers, knowing that we have tourism based, we've not funded our tourism well enough. Mm. Even as we hope for oil, I think it would be vital for this next period of time to put resources aside, specifically channeled towards tourism, because we have lit, near fruits to pick from that. We have an interesting environment and an interesting sector that mm -hmm. has participants that are fully knowledgeable and are well versed that it would seem with a little bit of push, mm. we can go very far and we can reach out to the rest of the world easily, from all corners of the world, that we can tap into the tourism market. Agro-based to me is the biggest fear I have going forward. Because for the last, from independence, mm. we've, ha we've hopped on the process of trying to do something about our agriculture. We have the whole of our population basically reserved within agriculture sector, mm. basically as far as productivity is concerned, mm. basically doing nothing as compared to the rest of the economy. The president is emphasizing value addition. Value. How does that feed into Value addition what has been the sing song of African governments from independence. We talk value addition again and again and again without fully internalizing why it doesn't work. The problem with value addition as a sing along is that we don't control the value chain on which we, claim we want to add value. We want to add value to the product, to the produce, the mm. raw materials we produce, and yet we send them in the market without any control over the process of the value chain itself. The best example I can utilize for us to really, really visualize this well is coffee. Coffee is one of the most important product we, we have in our country. Uh -huh. We produce the beans, I think we are very well versed with the coffee sector. 
we have talked about variation. We had a lot of our, some of our players doing the roasting and processing and, and then trying to export and capture in Western markets. And somehow we end up shocked. We had no impact. Of course, we wouldn't. Why? We don't control the value chain. Coffee is controlled by different players around the world. They control significant chunks and they are localized even within our economy. I'll just give an example of Olam. Olam is a coffee producer. It's a commodities producer and it handles coffee. It has its production facilities all the way down to our villages, Budinyanya, Buducheke, all the way. And it has all the way to Indonesia, Malaysia. It has all the way to Southern America and Colombia and the rest of them. So its reach is worldwide. Uh -huh. It's a five billion dollar company. Uh -huh. Its control over its, that value chain is significant. One of the biggest players in Olam is Singapore. Singapore, being aware of a player within the coffee or commodities value chain, came in and acquired Olam. So it controls Olam to a tune of 52%. Now, Singapore is the most significant player in the coffee business than Uganda would ever be with mm. all the beans we've ever produced. Uh. That's the one point I think. Secondly, Singapore is controlling its sovereign investment company, Temasek, has decided to take over 100% of this oil. So it's going to control the whole of it. Controlling the whole of it means again Singapore's play within the coffee value chain is even more significant. The only way Uganda, as a country, can have a significant way of transforming, I think the best way you, you can look at it, we send the beans. Ola, in Uganda, sends its beans. It acquires here mm. to its production facilities in Europe and around the world, Singapore and the rest of them. Mm. Now, if you control the player like Ola, it will then be our decision to rechannel and, and transplant its production facilities and localizing them. That way, as you acquire all the coffee around the world, we will then be able to acquire and play within the coffee value chain by getting beans from Colombia, getting beans from Indonesia, getting beans from Malaysia, getting beans from Brazil, and then we will have the production facilities here, depending on how you control the logistics because all logistics and the rest of them are controlled by these companies then you can localize and then you can talk of adding value thank you wanda let me bring in frank frank uh, looking at the major growth areas for this budget are you satisfied with the test that was applied to make the allocations because for example uh Mr. Wanda, he has alluded to the security sector. And I think he makes uh, an important point. Uganda is now relatively secure and stable. We do not have any internal insurgents. Yet again, the security sector is accounting for a substantial portion of the budget uh, to the detriment of other areas like you could say health, education, uh, so, as a citizen, are you satisfied with these allocations? Does it bring a bell in your mind? Yeah, uh, first of all, I fail to understand why most of the money over time that has been misappropriated has usually been channeled through the security sector. Because when you look at this 72 trillion budget, I've seen the security has been allocated up to a tune of 23% there about with the national budget. I actually wonder where the figures go because when you look at the people who are employed within the security sector, the soldiers, leave alone those who are the higher ranks, but these ones uh, are the very junior ranks. For instance, this, uh, this granted colleague in the previous, okay, this closing financial year, his name is Wilson Sabiti who had to end a life of a, a labor minister immediately after the labor day celebrations. Why did he end his life? It's because he was disgruntled. He had personal issues that he could not solve 
imagine being a bodyguard to a minister in charge of labor who does not mind about your welfare and your survival is dependent on the people that you left in the village. Because I got realized from his story, he was contacting his own people in the village for financial assistance. Imagine that irony. So this is a man who was at the rank of a private. A private in the UPDF army earns about 480,000 shillings, UGX. And I believe this is one of the reasons as to why uh, there has been a slight increment from that for eight for a private to something about 660,000 in this coming financial year. And may I get to understand, uh, this is just part of the transition plan. It's part of the transition plan because when you appease the security apparatus, uh. trust me, uh, they will help you to consolidate your stay in power. So I'm, I'm not so surprised that the regime is now prioritizing security in courts, but the actual gist of the matter, uh, it has a political motivation behind it. Uh. Uh, my colleague here has talked about Uganda being totally secure. It beats my understanding. Said relatively. Some, maybe relatively. <laughs> yes, he said relatively. <laughs> in relative <laughs> terms, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think that's a natural assessment, in relative for me, terms. For me, as a son of the soil who comes from a border town, way back in Boyer of Gonzo West Kasasa district, mm. I find this puzzling. We are marking an anniversary on the 16th of June since uh, the so-called ADF breached border security spent as much as an hour terrorizing innocent unarmed students of Lovidia Secondary School. Imagine a full one hour of noise and screams and wailing. And it took, it took, it took uh, security, which was just a few meters away, up to two hours to arrive at the scene when these people have done everything that they desired to do. As if that was not enough, a few months later, even the tourism sector was attacked. We saw two holidaymakers being shot and killed and their vehicle burnt to ashes by, uh, by, by rebels, alleged rebels of the ADF who breached steel security, plunged into the national park and reached the holidaymakers. So you wonder why with all these inflated figures of the budget, of the security budget, we still experience those breaches, those security breaches. Because I thought a regime that uh, prioritizes security would at least uh, emphasize having uh, some of its income generating ventures like tourism, at least fully protected. The education sector, because the school it falls under the education sector, the school child attacks, also fully protected. Uh, and again, within the, within the city center, we are seeing urban crime resurging, people mm. being kicked on the streets of Kampala. You find a citizen walking and he's just kicked by a street crook. Then you get to realize that most of the security is actually allocated to the so-called VIPs. You see one minister moving with a full battalion of police officers, counterterrorism, and soldiers. These are v an ordinary citizen who is on the street has just closed the mobile money kiosk, walked for almost a kilometer without seeing a single police officer patrolling at least the streets. You look at the security CCTV systems, which are supposed to monitor the urban crime. Mm. In Uganda, uh, in, in juxtaposition to other countries, when you look at our police, uh, they sit on the CCTV and enjoy the crime that is going on. <laughs> on the streets. That's, instead that's of a alerting, cynical comment. What do you mean, if, if you could just substantiate that, what do you mean by... <laughs> like they they just wait for the crime to end and yeah. then they take action. Yet I would expect them that when they are monitoring a citizen being terrorized on the street, it is paramount for them to alert an immediate police post around to go and Respond. rescue this uh, mm. tormented citizen. But in Uganda it is, the, it is the opposite. The crime first ends, then we see uh, the CCTV clip emerging. So uh, those budget figures regarding security do not impress me at all because I know they are going to prioritize the external expeditions going into the Congo to plunder natural resources, 
of, the, of, of those uh, foreign countries, <coughs> going to Somalia to almost do the same thing. Yeah, that's my assessment of security. Then back to the entire nation, national budget yeah. in context. <coughs> May I think uh, the president, Mr. Um, Seven, General um, Seven, he wanted to make a protest. It is some sort of protest budget. It is the first of its kind that we are hitting that figure. Protesting against... He's protesting oh. to the West. He's showing them mm. that with or without your support, I can still run this economy. Me, that's my thinking. That's why he had to inflate, inflate those figures to 72 trillion shillings. Mm. To send a message to them that with or without your foreign aid, I can still stand. Notwithstanding the fact that he, he still has to uh, fa facilitate this budget, how is he going to raise that revenue? Yet even the preceding financial years, he has been experiencing shortfalls and deficits of raising, <coughs> of raising those revenue projections of the URA, like my brother here, Chamangas, has <coughs> highlighted. Previously, they had anticipated to raise something like 29 trillion, mm. but they had a shortfall of about 2 trillion shillings. Therefore, I am just imagining, I'm wondering how, what science they are going to use to raise the 72 trillion shillings. Borrowing, perhaps. Uh, they're going to borrow internally yeah. or externally? From the donors. <coughs> From the donors. Yes. Yet, uh, we saw the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, trying to react towards the recently passed Anti-Homosexuality Act and the World Bank itself. So are they also going to turn around and turn a blind eye to their uh, threats and sanctions and go ahead to issue those loans or it's what I'm trying to, to uh, ascertain? Then secondly, uh, I'm seeing government going for its citizens in terms of uh, raising revenue. They are going to tax the people in the informal sector. They are going to put that emphasis on, on those who are doing local businesses within the country. And sadly, they are going to spare the foreign investors. For them, they will still enjoy their incentives, the tax holidays, uh, the free electricity, uh, the free uh, free land and all that. So, gone are the days when the ordinary citizens would be an would anxiously wait to see what's going to be discussed in the national budget. People would even take that to be a public holiday. They would sit and anxiously wait for the head of state to read to them those figures. But today, as I speak, the citizens lost hope because now this is more of a national cake sharing. They put their, their cake and slice it according to who is going to take what. So we, n we are now having a budget that's not going to serve the interests of the people. Why am I saying so? In one of the figures that I saw, they have allocated about 20 billions for rehabilitation of regional hospitals, which they might not even rehabilitate. And in juxtaposition of over 40 billions for furnishing their, furnishing their offices and uh, having those per diem and trips and all that. So you get to realize that the budget is actually not serving the interests of the ordinary citizen. Yet it is that ordinary citizen who is being milked and overtaxed to finance these same budgets. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Quite a bleak assessment, I should say, from Frank, but well, focus on Parliament takes a short break. When you return, we'll continue the discussion on the budget. See you shortly. Digital rights are those human rights and legal rights that allow individuals to access, use, create and publish digital media or to access and use computers, other electronic devices and telecommunication networks. Digital rights include a right to freedom of expression, information and communication through technology, a right to privacy and data protection, a right to credit for personal works, a right to universal and equal digital access, a right to identity, a right to anonymity, a right to be forgotten and a right for protection of minors among others. The state's digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. <laughs> 
It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak out or report to the responsible parties when one's rights are violated. Welcome back. In this segment of the Focus on Parliament, we focus the discussion on the political corruption with respect to the budgetary processes. And Timothy, I am beginning with you yes. once again. The president, on the occasion of delivering the State of the Nation address, vowed to stamp out corruption in broad terms as a whole out of the country. A call that he reiterated yesterday while presiding over the budget trading session of the parliament. Fast forward, uh, I think it is also quite unprecedented that three members of parliament in a single soup, moreover, legislators from the ruling party, have been arraigned, charged, and remanded for corruption, specifically respecting the budgetary process because uh, according to the charge sheet is that they were manipulating that process by soliciting for a bribe to enhance the budget of the Uganda Human Rights Commission. Is this some sort of a flicker of hope for the Ugandan that finally uh, the president is really serious about this issue? The fight against corruption again for me in Uganda starts and ends with the political will of this country. Every time and every, uh, every, every, every initiative by, because we have institutions in this country that are charged with the mandate of fighting but also working around these menaces of corruption to, 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 to prevent really and ensure that there's, uh, there's prosecution, there are investigations and there are measures being put in place to ensure that corruption is fought and fought in, 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 in the best way possible. The remarks by the president, whereas they are, um, they, they are already, um, there, there is something that is being done by seeing the, the few um, of the MPs, the three MPs being arraigned before court and uh, demanded. I think that uh, there's a bigger discussion for us to have as a country uh, in light of this menace because as earlier mentioned, I think that it takes a bigger chunk of, of um, a bigger chunk of our problems. All these resources that we are discussing today, in terms of allocation, the the, the, the failure to their execution lies in corruption. Mm. The failure to resource mobilize, even locally. Tax compliance, tax execution. Look at the Auditor General's report. The Auditor General report highlights that um, in, the, in, the, in the previous financial year, close to 10 trillion was lost to corruption. corruption. And that's what is recorded. There, there, there is definitely more than that that is not recorded. A lot of it goes to that, towards that direction. Mm -hmm. Two, looking at the, the available resource that we have as a country at our disposal, was discretionary budget is so minimal that if it's exposed to corruption, we have nothing to, to, to spend. An example of this coming financial year, close to 46% of, of, of the proposed budget will go towards debt repayment. Looking at the available resource that you have as a country towards, towards service delivery is so minimal. Say 46% goes towards uh, debt repayment. You have a good percentage of it going towards um, towards uh, uh, payment of wages, salaries, uh, the, the, the day to day in running of, 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 of government. A huge percentage of it. You have very minimal money of it going towards service delivery. Include now the, 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 the corruption menace. Your question goes towards whether indeed the president means his words. Mm. I think that um, we've had and continue to have a lot of reports, a lot of, um, a lot of evidence presented, including these institutions that are working on, on corruption. And by the way, the truth is this, whereas corruption is widespread across the country, there are very few individuals who are very known 
well known to be corrupt or they are, they are highly suspected notorious <laughs> notorious of corruption uh. very little is being done they are being sanitized they are being praised all over and it, it defeats the, the fight against corruption it's good that uh, a few of the MPs and some of the other suspects have been presented before court mm -hmm. but again looking at the bigger picture of ensuring that we fight corruption it must go beyond this one institutions that are, are charged with the mandate of fighting corruption must be enabled must be allowed to execute their mandates mm. an example of parliament parliament itself first of all exercises looking at the mandate that it executes including the budget that we are, we are discussing its mandate extended towards appropriation they also charged with the mandate of ensuring that they conduct oversight. In the recent days, we've seen Parliament being brought in the space of, of, of misuse of resources and corruption. The more, more authority for them to get into the, 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 the space where they are oversighting other, other people who are utilizing resources brings the same questions. Parliament, in the past and recently, they are, they are the ones who investigate the reports of the Auditor General. The Auditor General undertakes the, the investigations, presents to the committees of Parliament, or presents them to Parliament. Parliament uh, investigates the matters and presents them in the Treasury Memorandum. What is done to them? Again, it is shelved. We've had these reports. Nothing is done. Again, the Auditor General, the IGG, the IG, the Inspector General of the Office of the Inspector General of Government. A lot of reports are presented to Parliament. What is the concern is that we are frustrated. Many times we want to undertake an investigation. We receive the order from above. We are incapacitated and we can hardly do anything. The institutions, we have now seen the uh, the, 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 the office that is now charged against the fight of corruption under the president's office, under uh, Nakalema, I don't know what's uh, inspector. Uh, what's Investors the Protection Unit. Yes, something. yes, yeah. Uh, mm. There's a lot of effort. Without them being allowed to execute their mandate, there have been concerns around the minerals where we are actually looking at a lot of potential. The level of corruption in that space is, is, is un unimaginable. And so for me, again, I think that um, the, 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 the country must come at a space where we are discussing the question of corruption. But more importantly, is allowing these institutions to execute their mandates. Because the fight of corruption cannot start and end with the president. But also, it's too much burden for the president, by the way, of thinking of corruption, you are trying to manage it. Everything is centered at the, at, at the president. The president, the president, has a role to play, but he must allow the institutions to, 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 to execute their mandate. Otherwise, the direction the country is taking, uh, again, you'll find that others, the, the instructions being given that don't take that direction, but also we must mean what we say. The individuals that are being uh, highlighted, the, the, I saw yesterday the president, uh, when, when he was making his remarks, the MPs tried to bring the issue of the commissioners and he said, no, 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 don't bring me into those matters. They are matters that are true, maybe they are under investigations, but uh, I think we must be very firm in terms of how corruption is dealt with in this country. Otherwise, efforts on this budget that we are discussing will be in futility. I've discussed with some of my colleagues who work in the local government, and they can literally tell you that um, there's, there, there's very little that can be done within the current system or within the current mechanism in the local government in terms of service delivery. Actually, most of them have told me that of the money that they receive, a lot of it is, 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 is kept by them. Very little goes towards you know, service delivery. So there's a, there's a bit of challenge across both in the local government and in the national government. The figures that I, 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 I evidently have uh, is for this financial year that's coming to an end. We had a budget of 52.7 trillion budget. 10% of it, which, which, which comes to around 5, five trillion. 
went to, to the local government. Of that five trillion, only four trillion, close to four trillion, was going into welfare, was going into paying salaries. We are left with almost only one trillion. That goes towards service delivery. Service delivery. And that also partly is subjected into corruption. And so I think that the conversations around con corruption must not be just rhetoric. We must act. I saw the president yesterday reminding the country of the journey that they have had in the past, where there are some two individuals who went to attack um, uh, a community and then they killed some, uh, some individuals in the community. And they had to bring them in the public and shot them in order to make a case. I'm not saying that should be the direction that we, we should take as a country, but we must take very firm decisions as a country to ensure that we fight this corruption. If we deal with the corruption, we have made, I think, for us, we've solved almost 50% of our problem. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Mm -hmm. uh, Frank, yes, we we'll continue to examine mm -hmm. the president's attitude mm -hmm. uh, in the effort to combat mm -hmm. corruption. Uh, of course, by contextualizing these two significant speeches, mm -hmm. one on the occasion of marking the state of the nation address, mm -hmm. and yesterday, uh, on the occasion of reading the national budget. Mm -hmm. The president yesterday reiterated his strong call to stamp out corruption. Mm -hmm. But Timothy here has alluded to uh, an important episode in that speech mm -hmm. where the president was interrupted by legislators mm -hmm. asking him to intervene in the alleged corruption at parliament, mm -hmm. uh, which of course has now uh, engulfed the four commissioners. Mm -hmm. So, and, and his response was rather interesting. He said, do not involve me in your things. Uh, me, the question I am addressing is rather a broader one. I think that, 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 that was how he circumvented it. So, is this really a president that is resurgent who means what he says? Should we have better hopes as citizens that after all now, uh, that members from his party, he now recognizes the problem and he's bringing them to book. Should we have hopes as citizens that finally something is really being done about corruption, especially respecting the budget process? Personally, I don't have much hopes that he's doing anything. Because to me, that is just trouble rousing. He's trying to show the citizens that he's doing something but in actual sense, and just like the predecessor of the incumbent inspectorate of government, uh, the Honorable Irene Muriagonja said that thieves behind, hide behind the seven. I remember the monitor writing that article some time back. I also subscribe uh, to her findings. Indeed, thieves hide behind the head of, head of state and the first family. Because when you look at one of the apprehended lawmakers, who are facing the knife, the, the, the sharp edge of the corruption, the impeding corruption knife, the Honorable Sister Namaji Donozio. She has been one of the law lawmakers who drive the most uh, fancy ride of the Toyota series, rated to uh, something close to half a billion. That one which had a personalized num number plate of NCB, Namaji Sister Donozio, which some colleagues have <laughs> taken to be non-communicable diseases. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm private to information that uh, the president had tried to rescue her from falling into the trap at the start of the tenure of this, uh, th this term of 2021-2026. By doing what? He called her aside and cautioned her against sitting on the budget committee. Mm. He was trying to show her that, my girl, please don't fall into the trap of that particular committee. According to security sources, the president did everything possible to save her from falling into that trap. Mm. And he's the same person that you're telling me is serious about combating corruption. That's out. <coughs> Secondly, there is overwhelming evidence implicating and incriminating the head of the institution of the legislature, who happens to be the speaker. At some point, she even refunded iron sheets, which implied she had been caught with exhibits, 
when you when you find with with X bits of missing items, what does it turn out to? Am I culpable? I'm supposed to be culpable. But if I can take back iron sheets and even fail to charge me before the DPP, then it means you don't have uh, the grounds to say that you're going to fight corruption. Yet you're selectively persecuting uh, the small fish. Mm. These MPs are just small fish, the three of them. Even as we speak, one is out, one has got bail. The Honorable Paul Akamba has been granted bail, cash bail of 13 million shillings. What is 13 million shillings? in the context of the money that they have been they have been inflating for the previous financial years that they have been in parliament. Because this is a scheme that has been ongoing mm. over time. You know? They have been conferencing at Hotel Africana, meeting uh, heads of MDS, cracking deals with them that hey, you need this amount but inflate it to this figure, the excess is going to come to us. That's how they have been doing it within their racket. And the president has been privy to this information all along. All along, he has been privy to it. Not until uh, I'm told it was the head of the Uganda Human Rights Commission, uh, Justice uh, Maria Mwangadia, who took uh, recordings, voice recordings of the meeting, one of their meetings in May, which they held in, in Ottawa, Africana, uh, incriminating those legislators soliciting for more money in excess in respect of the, of the budget of the HRC. Mm. So the president has, not, has never been serious in fighting corruption. Look at his cabinet reshuffle. A, a good number of cabinet ministers, including the prime minister, vice president, deputy prime minister, name it, were involved in that scandal of sharing items that were meant for the vulnerable poor, the Karama Jones. But how many ministers did he drop and how many did he, did he retain? Majority are still part of cabinet. He only sacrificed these two and left the Rogolovis, uh, the Nabanjas, you get. So, in that context, I don't think he has the grounds to fight corruption to the expectations of the citizens. Not until the citizens see him serious for the very first time. I want to reflect on some article that I wrote last year in the Monitor in June where I argued that the judiciary is just used to silence debate, public debate, to call the tempers of the fu furious public, the infuriated public that mm. would wish to see action being done. So what does the judiciary do? It delays the execution of, of, the, of the involved culprits. Because mm. if I may ask you, when, when was the Iron Sheet scandal, when did it come out to the public limelight? some time back, that, that, that's last year, when the ministers were taken uh, before the anti-corruption court. Where did the case files end? Has, ever, has anybody ever bothered to follow up on those particular cases of the, of the three charged ministers? You get. So I think even the judiciary itself is a conduit of this whole system. It's just meant to sanitize and account to the donors, the Western donors, that Please don't bring in sanctions. We are doing something locally. So I don't expect even these MPs to be convicted. I mm. don't see any of them getting convicted. Unless we see something of, like the matter of Kazima, Godfrey Kazima. He's the only high profile person that I've seen face the wrath of the judiciary in, in respect of the corruption charges. Because even as we speak, he has been behind the callers for some good time. You get. Uh. And then it is my prayer that these MPs who are implicated, those who are charged, even government officials, are at least subjected to the same harsh conditions that inmates within prisons face. That's when I'll be convinced that these people <laughs> have suffered long enough. Because recently I was in Rosera, I've been there on, on Thursday, I was there on Thursday. The, the environment I saw in prison. These prison warders were warming up for these people to come and they said we are receiving VIPs. So they know these people are going to come with money, you know, <laughs> within the prison. And they get uh, given the good facilities. Compared to a street hawker who is going to be remanded, he has to share small space with, with several other inmates. Majority of them are even contracting TB. 
you cannot go to Rosira and you fail to contract tuberculosis because of the overwhelming congestion that is there. If only those MPs can also sleep and share the same facilities with those other inmates, that's when I will be convinced that they that they're also facing the wrath of of their evil deeds. But short of that, as long as they're also even in prison, there's selective, there's that sort of uh, cast, casting that these are high-profile prisoners. We put them in VIPs. They enjoy the SC what? They're not suffering. They are not. When you compare them to other inmates. So they don't face that bit of suffering. At least if they were facing it, maybe they would be compelled to abandon their corruption tendencies. But if, if they are still facing uh, good treatment, even within prisons, then trust me, the corruption will prevail. It will proceed and go on and on and on. Then as for the president, if he's serious about, it, about this, he should stop uh, succumbing to political intimidations of the people he, he apprehends. Because whenever he gets someone within the net, whenever corruption catches up with uh, a government official, we see specific groupings, whether religious groupings, ethnic groupings, coming out of the president. That, hey, this is our child. Spare him or not. We are, if you don't do that, we are going to react politically. You will not get our votes, something of the kind. You click. Yeah, uh, then reflecting on the president's remarks of yesterday when he said don't involve me in the issue of commissioners. To me, I interpreted it as a signal, an indirect signal to the NRM MPs to use their individual sense of judgment and go ahead and append their signatures to the censure motion. That's how I interpreted it. He was telling them, do what you think is right. Mm. But as for me, I have no final say on that. Imagine a, whole, a full chairperson of the party failing to take a position within something that he knows that is an illegality. Because by his position, we know he's uh, the Minister of Finance. He's then the President of the Minister of Finance. Yes, by his the Principal Minister of mm. Finance, yes. He knows very well that he did not sanction any 1.7 million shillings to be a service hour to the commissioners. He knows it very well. But he's turning a blind eye to this illegality. Instead of giving direction to his party members to do the right thing. So may I think the NRM MPs, if they have some remaining sense of sobriety, they should go ahead and sign the censure the motion. At least we shall judge them by individual merit. Individual merit, rather. Yeah. Mm. So corruption in Uganda, it will continue to prevail for as long as we involve politics into it. Uh, it is not until that we allow systems to be autonomous, uh, institutions like the Inspectorate of Government, by its mandate, it is one which is supposed to follow up on the corrupt, but even it fears to take action on the corrupt because it's waiting for the, head of, for the position of the, of the head of the, of the state. Rather. Because when you look at even the Uganda Parliament exhibition, people petition the IJG, Honorable Betkami, with evidence about what was transpiring within the parliament. But she feared to intervene. She was waiting for the position of the president on the same. So even these systems that we are having that are supposed to curb corruption are living under fear. Those who help them can't take action until they are directed by the, by the head of state. So we need to decentralize power. Let the president allow systems to work that's when we shall have corruption as history in this country. Because that 10 trillion is too much to be lost to corruption. Mm. It can do a lot, infrastructure development, uh, within the education system, we shall not have UPE schools studying from under trees, you know. We shall not have even our colleagues going out, labor externalization in search of jobs where they're even killed. Our hospitals will be well facilitated, you get. So it's very important to curb corruption if we are to have effective service delivery and national growth. I thank you. Thank you, Frank, for your views. Yes, Mr. Wanda, corruption uh, continues to rear its ugly head uh, in the course of the country to realize its developmental aspirations. From an economic standpoint, uh, respecting the budgetary process, what can we do about this problem? Now that the president 
seems to indicate strong support uh, to stamp it out of the political processes. And that's an interesting question. Uh, when we talk of corruption in our system, I worry there's a lot that we, that we miss out. Mm. We fail to conceptualize one fact. I think corruption is the way our system functions. The way we allocate positions in, in almost every institution is based on what one would interpret as corrupt ways. The way resources are being channeled to a certain extent have been through a system that could be viewed as corrupt. If you have the public sector, that has more SUVs, uh, what you call land cruisers, and all these other cars that you find our bureaucracy and political class utilize. And you find that there are more in number in our economy than ambulances. Mm. That's a very corrupt system. Mm. There is no way you would neglect within the health sector alone. The cars that our bureaucracy utilizes are more than the ambulances that are in hospitals around the country. How else would you define that? Mm -hmm. So when ultimately we get to the point where one or two people are symbolically placed before court we, to try to be tried, mm -hmm. through the history, it will be rare for them to spend time in museum on charges and convicted to be there. First of all, they have all the means within their abilities to interfere with the whole process. Mm -hmm. that's, this, that's, that's one thing. I don't know how many of us have read stories of people found with billions of shillings in their bedrooms. Mm -hmm. One of the suspects, allegedly. Yes. Some stash of money was recovered. Many more. We mm -hmm. have very many people moving around whose homes were raided by, where, by their own workforce mm. and carried off with bags of cash mm. being held outside the banking system in billions. Small, some of it is in dollars. What does that tell us? That the process of channeling resources, resource allocation in the economy mm. is interfered with at a particular important at particular important notes that resources don't reach a common man. It's just that simple and direct. Yeah. If we have a, a recent memory that was Cato Sea Road, the whole road was eaten up. Yeah. When we hear about road constructions and the projects and the rollover of projects and the costs that are involved, yeah. dig a little bit deeper. It's all a corrupt system. People when you hear UNRWA Mm. and the resources that were allocated to it and what really went to constructing roads. It's pretty obvious. So, MPs ultimately, who have been called at a point then when corruption has become a sensitive issue, I think may bear a little bit of symbolic hanging, but I don't think we are digging deep to approve what you consider to be corruption. Why? Because today, when you back to the budget, most of the resource envelope that is going towards funding what we hope are these projections will be, will be loans from the international community. Many of these allocate their resources, their capital, mm. to a country like ours based on reports they read from either the IMF, World Bank, and we know what has been going on in that area. And then, especially if we are not, no longer going to rely fully, as middle income economies, we may not fully rely on the World Bank anymore mm -hmm. as the co funder <coughs> of our budget. Mm -hmm. So we go to commercial borrowing. Mm -hmm. Commercial borrowing relies a great deal to reports from credit agencies. All of them have been downgrading us in the last few months. Spears and SP downgraded us to be negative. And if you indicate stable, Fitch downgraded us to B3, and 
moody than Brenda has to be negative as well. What this indicates, the factors they look at, one is the leakages within the system of resource allocation. If you are going to rent Uganda resources, how well and efficient the institutions handle the resources without resources going to the core drivers of the economy to grow the economy fast enough to pay you back? That's very important for any, any lender mm. to read and understand. And if there is a huge chunk of corruption that at important notes drains away resources, they will know that every time I offer these people our money, mm. they are going to, the, the resources are not going to be fully utilized, maybe half of them will be utilized. So the, the hope for economic growth, funding of a particular sectors for future growth will not materialize, and so my payback will be a little bit difficult. Why don't I increase the interest rate so that I protect myself in the near future rather than hope for anything to come from that economy in the long run? That is a big problem. So corruption is is a, is a potent, potent, potent killer, especially when it drains, especially when it's in important nodes of the economy mm. and it drains resources, no channel for the growth of the economy. That to me is a big factor. And now we are we are pinning a lot of our hopes on oil revenues and oil investments. Investments initially for the next period of time and then the revenues that may come along the way. But ultimately, if part of the investment funding that may come in is channeled into private hands that probably at the same time offshore the same funds that have come to do project funding here because people are connected and we, we've had the president, I think, arrested a few people, the security services arrested a few people who were standing between the president and some investors to see that they needed a little bit of funding to some people before. So, so part of the project funding is getting access to the president. A person who budget, you know that a million dollars goes towards these individuals, then I access the president, I talk about the project, maybe it comes my way. But, of course, they will have to. They will have to talk about the million they put aside for individuals. It's part of project funding. Uh. And so ultimately what comes in, maybe it was supposed to be 10 million, one has gone to, to do something else. It has been offshore. You'll be receiving probably less than nine, and whatever happens along the way is draining the resources. When you have, as a society, a structure that allows our bureaucracy and uh, and part of the political class to drive in vehicles that will allow them to survive the impact of their poor planning and project implementation, especially as far as roads are concerned. You have potholes all across the, the system and the only way to survive them, to survive your own inefficient way and poor workmanship uh. is driving an SUV. An SUV paid by the taxpayer, mm. that's corrupt. Uh. So, Still a complex problem. Yeah, so picking out a few people who mm. have been recorded and ultimately seen, shown as a sample mm. to how the system works without touching the system itself will not change a thing. Three individuals in the parliament that have been exhibited as being <coughs> exorbitantly handling things in a particular way mm. doesn't change a thing. Mm. Thank you, sir, for your perspective. Timothy. As we conclude, um, help us, uh, you know, recommend <coughs> solutions. How do we best implement this budget? It's very ambitious. I understand it's going to um, trigger the expectations of Ugandans in as far as meeting uh, their service delivery needs is concerned. <coughs> what advice can you give to the implementers uh, 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 of these resources to really efficiently do something that is suitable for the ordinary citizen or even the citizen himself. Yeah. Mm. So I think the first is to really <coughs> manage expectation because we are already here. In terms, of, uh, in terms of whether we can go back, I think there is very little that we can do. <coughs> we need to manage our expectations and uh, not to have our expectations as high as possible from the citizenry. To, from the government side, I think that there, um, there are a couple of areas that we could actually um, 
look into. I think the first is on the is on the expenditure of, of, of the public of the, the of the public uh, office. Mm. And the monies that are being used towards uh, most of these offices they they are extremely exorbitant. The question of frugality I think comes in very handy to ensure that we cut our quote according to our size. The resources that are being misused really and this goes to the to the meaning of it as as as, as it really sounds to ensure that the resources that are available within our disposal are utilized well and utilized well means that at the end of the day there has to be value for money the citizenry is at the heart of all the decisions that we make the executive um, which again is the implementer and the primary implementer of this budget takes keen interest in ensuring that service delivery becomes the focal point of all these things parliament again um, which is charged with the mandates with all the mandates that uh, that, that the constitution provides budgeting except, uh, oversight, oversight appropriation and representation ensure that the mandate that they have clearly is executed but also reflects their, 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 their ambition of a citizenry based parliament which is at the core the other area i think that uh, again is on the fight against corruption um, to ensure that and this again goes back to the executive every every time unfortunately despite the existence of the institutions every time we are discussing corruption we have to find ourselves back to the executive. Not because that is how our legal framework um, envisages, but it's because of how the, the circumstances really we find ourselves. And given the fact that we're there, I think that the president, who is the head of the, of the executive, must be willing, must exercise the political goodwill to ensure that we fight this corruption. And the individuals that are set, because the fight against corruption must not only be done, but also it must be seen to be done. And mm. the public must be convinced that indeed there is some action being taken. And that must mean by its, as, as it sounds, those that are clearly being projected, we should not dismiss, con dismiss conversations of the corruption allegations. We must address, and we must address them as is required. Of course, with the hindsight that most of these are suspect until proven guilty by the by by, by courts, of course the judiciary has a role again um, to ensure that uh, it, it expedites most of these things that are again within uh, their their purview. Matters before brought before them, they should be exercised or executed hard and dispensed of in a timely manner. Otherwise, if they take longer we continue to exacerbate the question of corruption, allow institutions of courts to be premises where, you know, corruption is also being, you know, um, provided with an environment where it grows. And so I think that um, looking at the three arms of government, the parliament, the executive, and the uh, judiciary, there are very clear roles and efforts that could be put in place to ensure that uh, the question, that this budget is properly executed, but also at the heart of this is on the issue of being frugal, and that goes both to the to the executive and and the other arms of government. Mm. Two, I think the citizenry, there is there is need for us to continue demanding and holding these individuals uh, accountable, because mm. again they're exercising that on our behalf, and power and and, and, and many times. Governments give as much as it's pushed. Mm. Government can never be can never give anything at at at, at the discretion. Mm. It's to the extent that the citizenry can demand, the extent the citizenry can push. We've seen what is happening with the, with 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 uh, with some of the some of our colleagues who have taken the initiative of ensuring that Parliament is opened up. Whatever mess that is happening there is seen. And there's been a lot of effort and a lot of fruits by the way realized that open now, parliament is now in the bear and it can be held to account. 
some of the individuals who thought that you know they are untouchables, they can use these resources as and when you've seen a lot of there's been a lot of efforts, including uh, initiatives from our, our our colleagues out of the country who are who, who are sanctioning some of the individuals who seem to be extremely powerful. There are a lot of so I, I think that, that as citizens we have a, we have we have uh, we have a role to play to ensure that we participate in this process all these leaders are accountable and at the end of the day to be part of all these processes again mm. once 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 we give up as citizens we shouldn't give up things may look um, not very clear things may not be going according to their way but again this is the only country that we have i mean we can't give up we have to continue pushing we have to continue holding some of these leaders accountable i know we are now um, heading towards now the electioneering period and the citizens must at all times ensure that they are part and parcel of these processes to ensure that we, we, we are also contributing in whichever way possible to ensure that we have a better country it's a process not an event thank you thank you timothy for your perspective and for your patriotic guidance frank Yes, your concluding remarks on the topic with respect to the citizenry but also the actual implementers of the budget uh, well for this budget to be effective like we've all agreed corruption must be addressed and curbed but this is going to take the direct involvement of the citizenry like my preceding colleague has said uh, the people should be empowered and, uh, and reminded that they also have a role to play in how society is supposed to, actually in how they're supposed to be governed rather. We should put in place laws that protect whistleblowers. Whistleblowers should be protected so that they can at least report these scandals within government institutions. But we're in a system where even the whistleblower who tries to blow the trumpet about a scandal is instead uh, witch hunted and persecuted. So if we can at least address that, uh, we, we can put in place laws that guide and protect the whistleblowers, then I think they can, we can see citizen involvement into, uh, you know, driving the bet as far as corruption is concerned. Then secondly, we have to decentralize, we have to decentralize systems and we trim the president's powers so that he does, he does not have to be consulted about each and everything. Even con convicting a minister, a judge will first have to consult the president. You know, So we, we, we should not build such systems. We should allow institutions to function autonomously so that when a judge has overwhelming evidence on a corrupt minister, he or she will convict that individual without necessarily uh, hiring a phone call to State House for guidance on a judicial matter. Then secondly, um, the police and the CID, which are charged with investigating, should also expedite the investigations and draft these reports and uh, work hand in hand with the judiciary to have these matters dispensed out of the, out of the courtrooms. Because I failed to understand why a matter that was reported last year in the anti-corruption court concerning Anne Schitt's scandal is still pending to that. It is still pending despite the overwhelming evidence of ministers sharing the Anne Schitt. Uh, some were even found in ministers' funds being used as pen, pen houses. So I think as a, Uganda is still suffering because of failure to allow systems to function. So if these systems function, maybe we shall have a better country that is convenient for each and every Ugandan out there. Then even the people, the people also need to know that corruption starts with them. When that police officer on the road asks you for key to the dog, ask him, why am I giving you this? Try to find out why you're paying them. But, but if you're building a system where you're also participating in corruption, then you don't have to blame the government for being corrupt. Because it is starting with you. You're in a hospital, a government hospital. You know facilities are supposed to be free. A doctor is putting you in the corner telling you that, give me 100,000 and I help you deliver your baby. And you also go ahead to 
pull out that man and give to the doctor. You're doing yourself a disservice, you ordinary Ugandan. Ask him questions. Isn't he paid? Isn't he a civil servant? You know? So let us try to also fall out of that picture of the corrupt, like participating in corruption. We should not participate in it. We should, we only get what we serve. If we serve corruption, we shall get corruption. So to you ordinary Ugandans, be sober enough and learn to ask questions. If you're being, if a public servant is soliciting for a bribe from you to give you a job at uh, a local government, in civil service, in public service, anywhere, try to ask him, don't I qualify and my papers enough for me to be in that position? Then if you qualify, why are you giving out that money? So the system we want begins with us as ordinary citizens. That's all I can tell you. I thank you. Thank you, Frank, for sharing your views with us. Mr. Wanda, your closing remarks on the program, especially with regard to uh, the budget objectives that we have for the new financial year. How do we achieve them? Thank you again for having allowed me to participate and contribute some ideas on this. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, when we realize those four particular drivers to the, to the economy going forward, I identified where we felt <coughs> that uh, government has the ability at least to localize the world of intervention. But as far as the objectives are, objectives are concerned, a lot of it, of course, comes with the funding process. As long as we are having problems internationally, our funding abilities within the budget are going to be a little bit problematic. But given that you can see the, the ambition that lies in the foreign funding, we hope there's something that we are fully not aware of that will help drive this particular budget going forward. But it seems to be one with an extremely ambitious budget to begin with, and that seems to be also a transition one. So to me, is the one thing that has been driving my mind over this period of time is the ambition of the budget and where this ambition arose. Because the previous two budgets were a little bit constrained with a lot of cuts, 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 and then finally we have made a huge leap with this particular one. Going to 30% and I think within the region we could have the biggest budget percentage as a, as a percentage of GDP. To me, that shows a certain level of ambition. I don't know whether this is a confidence based on some particular confidence or with something we are really missing. But otherwise, it's a very good budget. It's an ambitious one. And if some of the items that have been touched on, especially as far as tourism is concerned and as far as, uh, as a agro-based intervention is concerned, knowledge and, uh, and mineral industrialization. Mm. We could have an interesting period going forward. Mm. Thank you, Wanda, Frank, and Timothy for your able participation on the program. I am sure it's been of great help uh, to the ordinary citizen out there. We encourage you to take very keen interest in the implementation of this budget for ultimately it is for your benefit. Once again, much appreciation to the viewers for keeping us company. From the startup to the conclusion of this program, appreciation to the production unit for keeping us live on air. You can engage us on our social media platforms. We are on X, we are on Facebook, we are on YouTube where you can watch and subscribe to this show. We'll see you next time. Be blessed.